it Suppose Congress isn't Congress. in session. We know that the habeas corpus is not uh, absolute in times of a public emergency. In the situation that Justice O'Connor describes, mm -hmm. President Lincoln comes to you, you're his attorney, mm -hmm. and he said, now the Congress isn't in session, I've got to do something. Uh, this is justice wants me to bring a, uh, a Southern sympathizer, I think he is, uh, causing tremendous problems, and I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have time to do that. I'm leaving him in jail. I guess the president would have the right to do that because he would well, be- Well, now you're changing your mind? I mean, I don't think the president has the right to do that if Congress is in session, but if Congress, it wasn't in session, I, I guess the president has the, I don't really know. Well, the Nor court- do I, no, no, I don't think anybody does. Don't it's all right. The courts don't know either. <laughs> uh, but you see the importance of consultation. You see the importance of the president and the Congress both uh, being political branches of the government, uh, cooperating, thinking, reasoning things out so that the Constitution is observed and, and protected even in, in, in times of, of great urgency. And Lincoln was very good about consulting, about writing uh, the reasons for what, of what he did. He felt guilty because he gave a famous speech, which you can look up. Don't you sit down, please. But, uh, you know, sh something along the lines of, shall all the laws go but one go unenforced so that that one remains in, power, in, in effect? As he was thinking, all the laws will not go enforced because we'll destroy the Union. That's Just what he say, was uh, thinking yeah. at the time the that one he is, entered it, that it, order. It, that's right. Are there rights that can be suspended in times of war? And if so, what are they? Are there rights that can be suspended in times of war? Well, we've had a couple of examples already. The right to choose where you live and to live freely was suspended, wasn't it? In Korematsu for people of Japanese origin. And the right to get up and walk around freely wherever you want was uh, suspended in Hirabayashi by a military order. So. You know, you've got two examples right in front of you, and I guess there are many others as well. But you've just talked about habeas corpus, so the Constitution speaks about that. But the more normal thing, and this doesn't help particularly, but it is, I think, the more normal way that judges will think about this. A lot of words in the Constitution are quite indefinite as to their content. See, it, the Fourth Amendment, it doesn't say the policeman can never go into your house without a warrant. It says that the policeman cannot engage in an unreasonable search and seizure. The 14th Amendment speaks of liberty, but it doesn't quite say what that liberty is. The First Amendment says that Congress shall not pass the law that abridges the freedom of speech. But what is the freedom of speech? Now, if you have, in time of peace, a policeman who's on the street and he sees a woman being dragged into an apartment house screaming, is he going to stop and wait for a warrant? Well, I should hope not. And the law will support him in that action because it's reasonable given the circumstance. So in war, there often are new circumstances of a special kind. And that's why so often you see the judges asking, well, given the circumstances, is this limitation and definition, a limiting definition of a right, is it called for by these circumstances? A question that's very hard to answer often. And we say it's easy in Korematsu. They got it wrong because we're looking at it with hindsight. And we each would like to think if we were there, we would have even written better dissents. That's what we'd like to think. And of course, the interesting thing about history is you never know, really, what it was like at the time. And that's why Justice Kennedy says, are there things going on right today that when people look back at us, they'll say, how could they be so blind? Why are independent courts important? Yes. Yeah. Because people have different opinions on different things, and you sometimes need to look at things from a different point of view. All right. Now, suppose during war, because this responds to your question, 
Suppose during the war the president said, I've got military courts, I want military courts to uh, be in charge of this state, be in charge of this reason, region. Is that proper? Civil war in the United States. I want military courts in Ohio. The rule is, do you know what the rule is? The rule is if the civil courts can be open, you must go to the civil courts. If they can't be because the enemy's in control or active hostilities are going on, then you can use military courts. Uh, so that's a balance that the law says, ex parte Milligan is the name of that case. That's a balance that the court has come to. You can use military courts sometimes if the civil courts are unavailable. Reasonable enough. I'll yes. go back for one second because this is making me change my mind about something. What is the most interesting thing about Korematsu? Now, I think at the moment, having listened to this discussion, that maybe the most important thing about Korematsu is each of us thinks, if we had it in the court today, it's a racial criteria. A racial criteria. They didn't do it to the Japanese in Hawaii. They didn't do it to the Germans. They didn't do it to the Italians. And, and immediately, red flags would go up a mile high. And you'd look back at that and say, oh my goodness, that really is, they have to have unbelievable evidence to sustain this, and they don't have any, all right? But now wait. This attitude you have in our minds and in your minds because of action people took in 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. And people in the country took the action to fight the racial criteria, and they changed not only the judge's mind, the judge's wouldn't, opinion wouldn't have lasted five minutes if President Eisenhower had not decided to send the 101st Airborne Division to Little Rock, Arkansas, where the governor was standing in the schoolhouse door with the state militia designed to block the entry of those black children. And you know why he sent the 101st? See, that doesn't resonate with you. You start talking to me, and those a little older even, about the 101st Airborne, my goodness, that was the division that went in on D-Day the toughest airborne division in the American Army, and he purposely picked that division because of its symbolic value. And he wanted to say everything about America is in favor of the integration and following the law. Do you see? Now, it's him, yes, but it's also millions of Americans who were willing to say, I'm going to take this issue on. It's not just the judges. So I think I'd look at Korematsu and say to you who are in high school, read this history. Don't forget the history of the United States of America because there were millions of people just like you who were willing to take on some of these issues, who were willing to fight them under law, but not just in the courts. It requires a lot of support to get those interpretations of the Constitution that we now have today. And as we all have said, this is ongoing. I remember the outbreak of World War II. I lived in Sacramento, California. Um, my father was an attorney. He had uh, clients who were Japanese. They were on a remote, uh, they were remote from the city. They were on a ranch. And I used to go out and play with uh, uh, the boy who was my age uh, while my father was uh, with his parents working out their problem. And one day he came to my house suddenly, unannounced, and uh, he had his favorite toy. His favorite toy he never, could never touch. It was a little samurai warrior in a glass case. It was in his room. Uh, that, but that was his toy, but he didn't touch it. And he was trying, tears came down, and he gave me the, he gave me the little soldier. And uh, I'll never forget it. I knew something was wrong. I didn't understand what was wrong. But what was wrong was, um, was that he was being sent to a relocation camp. Uh, and my father, who was an attorney, uh, was outraged by this. And so I, I knew this problem from a very, very young age, and I never forgot it.
Korematsu, Fred Korematsu, is a study in courage.